like I want my kids to look at me like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's all. Now with today's world, the kids are so advanced. I never Let's shut gonna, up. You're gonna do what I called you. Like, now come on and do what I told you to do. For real. Yeah, I miss him a lot. I think, it's more, I think it's more like an ego thing with parents, you know what I'm saying? They don't want other parents to look at them like, oh, that's how they're being brought up, or that's how it's... Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Parental Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Tiana Caprice, and on today's segment, we're going to do things a little different. On June 2nd, 2022, Catherine Millage was traveling to visit her sister in Florida with her seven-year-old daughter. During the course of this trip, Catherine was pulled over by a highway patrolman when things took a turn for the worse. The video that you're about to see is not in any way, shape, or form to bash, humiliate, or pick any sides. Viewer discretion is advised. As a mother, that was very difficult for me to watch. And in a situation like that, I don't know what I would do. Catherine, thank you for taking out the time to come and sit and speak with me on this matter. Now, walk me through exactly what happened on June 2nd, 2022. In June, I was driving to Florida to see my sister. Um, at the time, she lived in Brandon, Florida. And um, I was going to surprise her for my birthday. She didn't know. And my godson, my best friend, was having a birthday party. And I was going to see them, uh, me and my daughter. She was seven at the time. And um, a cop drives up behind me, pulls me over. I had my um, car tag taped to my back window because um, I had just got my car registered. I'm from Massachusetts. And um, they told me if it's raining, to tape it to the back. So that's what I did. He said he couldn't see it. And I said, okay, um, that's where I was told to put it. He said, I don't, that they told you wrong. Don't put it there. Mm -hmm. um, after that, he looked and um, I guess he went to the car and came back and he told me my license was suspended. And I was, I asked him, I was like, well, how did that happen? You know, he said, well, it was through this, this county. And I was asking him, you know, what, what do I do? Cause I've never had to deal with that. He said, well, I'll give you a chance to call someone, but the protocol is you're supposed to be, I'm supposed to arrest you. Well, I don't want to do that in front of your daughter. And I was like, okay, what what can I do? He was like, well, I'll give you a chance to call someone, figure out somebody can come get you. If not, basically that left me to think like, wow, I'm about to be arrested and my daughter's going to see me get arrested and she's going to go in the system. What do I do? So now at this point, um, I stepped out the car. I didn't want my daughter to hear the conversation. I was calling my mother and um, I was on the phone with my best friend, Tony, trying to explain to them to see if somebody can come to me or figure out how I can, what I can do. And um, the officer comes up to me, Officer uh, Scott Rigby. He said to me, um, get back in the car. I said, yes, sir. I plan on getting back in. I'm just on the phone trying to figure out, you know, how I can, get someone to come get my daughter. He said, no, you're gonna get back in the car. I said, sir, I, I am. I just, I'm trying to, I don't want my daughter to hear the conversation. That kept going and um, not one time did I yell or curse at him. So I was confused as to why I was being spoken to in that, that way. And um, 
He said, I don't care what you're doing. You're going to get in the car. At that point, he uh, grabs me. As he said, I was um, resisting and he's going to charge me with obstruction. And I said, well, what am I resisting? What, how am I obstructing you? I, you know, I'm just yelling at this point. I'm like my knee, my ankle, my shoulder. I'm just yelling body parts. Cause I'm like, what, what is, what are you doing? And he's pulling me to the back of, back of my car. Um, he told me to get on the ground. I said, I cannot, I had surgery prior on my knee, on my right knee. And I let him know I did have surgery. He said, I don't care, get down. Um, at this point, I'm just, um, yelling saying I'm not getting on the ground my daughter gets out the car and um she's yelling and um punching and kicking him and um at this point I'm like okay there's one or two things you can do you can either listen to what he's saying because if I react the way I want to I could possibly lose my life and I won't be here my daughter will have no mom or I can go ahead and get on the ground and let him throw me on the ground and re-injure my leg. So I'm like, okay. Now I'm trying to calm my daughter down because she's biting him. She's kicking him and I'm scared he's going to push her around the side of the highway. I'm like, okay, what do I do? And he's, I told him, I said, look, sir, my knee is hurting. He's like, tell your daughter to calm down. So I'm telling Nevaeh to calm down. She's she's going at it. She's telling you to calm your daughter down while he's throwing you to the ground. So he's trying to tell you to keep your daughter calm in the midst of chaos. Right. Okay, go on. I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So I'm trying to calm her down, but also keep myself calm at the same time. Um, he then wraps his leg around my right knee that's the knee I told him I had surgery on so now I'm like okay I'm going down for real this time so he ends up hurting my right knee and I fell to the ground and I'm holding myself up because now there's an anthill on the ground and I'm like those things can they can eat you up <laughs> it's 105 degrees outside I'm not laying in that so I'm fighting I didn't want him to think I was fighting him. I'm just fighting to move away from where we were. So he slams me down and I kind of get back up and my daughter is kicking and bite, fighting him. And um, at this point, I don't remember it happening, but my daughter said, mommy, your shoulder, your shoulder. And um, I'm kind of like, well, Nevaeh, you have to calm down, baby, calm down. And, um, sorry. At this point, someone pulled over. I just seen a man pull over and he had, it looks like maybe a red Mustang. And I'm like, okay, maybe he's going to come help. He's going to record. The man just sits there and watch. And, um, he watched him put the handcuffs on me. At this point, he takes my daughter's tablet. My daughter's trying to record. I, I'm telling her, I'm like, Nevea, call Nana, call somebody. He takes my daughter's tablet, toss, toss it in the grass. Um, at this point now, it's like other police who pull up. And I'm like, they're going to take my baby from me. That's all I can think. They're going to take my baby from me, and I'm going to get arrested. And I'm thinking, my now my mom is on the phone. She's like, well, Catherine, what'd you do? What happened? I'm like, I don't know, Mom. I don't know what I did. I honestly don't. I've never been in trouble with the law ever in my life. I've never been in trouble my whole life with anything. So now my mom is like, Catherine, tell Nevada to calm down. I can't hear what the cops are saying. My daughter's yelling. I'm I'm hurting at this point. So I'm telling them, like, he, now that the other cops are there, Officer Scott Rigby asked me, he was like, okay. He says, get up. I said, I can't get up. I said, why can't you get up? You no, know, Can you tell me what you think happened to why you can't get up? And I'm like, I look at him and I said, you know why you threw me down. Well, that's because you were obstruct obstructing me. You weren't listening. 
So I just kind of left it alone. At this point, I got two sets of handcuffs on my on me instead of one. I have two cuffs on. They helped me up and put me in the back of the car. They're trying to take Nevaeh to another car. My baby said, I'm not leaving, Mommy. I said, sir, I'm not getting in the car unless my daughter's getting in the car with me. She gets, my daughter is now running around the car. Mind you, we're on the side of the highway. So I'm like, just let her get in the car with me. My baby's not going to stop. Let my baby get in the car with me. She's on the side of the highway. It's your job to keep us safe. Right now, we're both unsafe. So she runs to the other side. She gets in. Um, I ask, he takes my phone. Another officer came and I asked him, you know, can I call my mom and tell her what's happening? He said, no, your phone belongs to him now. So they take my phone, my wallet, my suitcase, and they took all my belongings. And um, the ambulance finally shows up. And immediately he was like, oh, is she under arrest? Scott Rigby said no. He said, well, you need to take those handcuffs off of her and she's coming with me. And I thank God for that, for that ambulance because um, I didn't know what was going to happen from there. I'm like, all these cops are here, it's just me. And your daughter. Right, what do I do? So they finally, it took them a little while. They're talking to my daughter. There's bees flying around me. I'm allergic to bees. So Nave is like, I'm going to go get mommy's EpiPen. So she's asking the other officer, can I go get my mommy's EpiPen? So she gets out the car. Again, we're on the side of the highway. She runs to the car to try to go get my EpiPen. They grab her and she's like, no, get off of me. I'm getting my mom's EpiPen. And um, I'm telling them, look, I'm allergic. I just don't want to get stung. Can I get in and close the door? He said, well, that sucks. I'm not allergic. Officer Scott Rigby said that? Other officer. Um, I don't remember his name, but he's a, he was, his, his vest said sheriff on it. Okay. So um, now I'm wondering where Nevaeh is. The other officer is now asking my daughter what her name is, what her, when's her birthday. She didn't answer anything. And um, she gets in the car saying, Mommy, why are they talking to me? I don't want to talk to them. They question the minor. Yeah. Okay. And um, now Scott Rigby says, the ambulance, we're going to let you go with the ambulance. You're going to be, when you get there, you need to make sure you, after everything, you need to turn yourself in. And you need to come turn yourself in to the Tifton County Police Department. And I said, turn myself in for what? He said, you you have to turn yourself in because you obstructed. And I kind of just looked at him. He said, do you understand what I'm saying to you? I said, yes, sir. Just answered so I can get an ambulance and go. I said, yes, sir, I understand. He said, okay. And I asked him, I was like, well, can I at least get my phone? Can I get my suitcase? And he was like, I guess you can have your, your wallet. I was like, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. The guy from the ambulance, he went and he grabbed my suitcase for me because I wouldn't have had any clothes or anything. He grabbed my suitcase. He grabbed my wallet. He went and picked up my daughter's tablet. And so at this time, my daughter said, Mommy, I sent a message to Nana and somebody else on the email. And I'm like, okay, shh, don't say anything. I'm like, just be quiet. It's okay. And um, we get in the ambulance and we get to the hospital. Immediately, I'm crying. I got ants and stuff on my legs. I'm being, my ankles are being bitten up. And my daughter's like, we got to help my mommy. We got to help her. And I'm crying. I'm trying not to because I didn't want my daughter to see. The cop, I mean, sorry, not the cop. The doctor comes in uh, the room and he immediately pops my shoulder back in place. I didn't know it was dislocated. So when your daughter was yelling, mommy, your shoulder, your shoulder, she saw your- I'm guessing that's when it happened. Okay. I didn't feel it until afterwards. He immediately just popped my shoulder back in place in the room. They looked and he asked me what happened. I said, well, I was uh, assaulted by a state trooper. He stopped, he stopped me there. He walked out the room. They came in with a, a machine. He took my knee x-rays. He took x-rays off my shoulder. He said, you need to get out of town as soon as possible. They were supposed to escort you. 
no one escorted you here. So you need to leave and go back to wherever you live and go see a doctor in your town. Now I'm like, well, what happened? What's going to happen? He was like, it's not the first time we've seen this, but just go ahead and hurry up and leave. So I'm like, okay, I don't have anyone here to come pick me up. The doctor said that? Yeah, doctor told me to hurry up and, and go. So I'm like, okay. At this point, I'm like, it's obviously not the first time they've encountered this. So uh, they gave me a chance to call my mom. My mom was like, I'm 30 minutes away. She gets to the hospital. She They get the paperwork, and they rush me out of the hospital. I'm in a wheelchair. They push me out to the car. And uh, we end up staying in a hotel with my mom, and we called almost every place to try and find my car. And the guy that impounded it, they said, um, <laughs> He said, well, we're not supposed to give you the car because the cop said, you know, your license is suspended. But he let me get my car back for $275. And he said, God bless you. I said, like, well, why would you say that? He said, God bless you. He said, you're one of the, the good ones. And to me, my mom was like, no, he was saying you're one of the lucky ones. Yeah. So all that happened and my daughter is <laughs> so strong <laughs> my daughter is amazing at this point she's like you know what mommy you're okay I got your back <laughs> so if it wasn't for her I probably wouldn't have made it through that situation the way I did absolutely because you were thinking once for yourself and two times for her mm -hmm. so when you finally got with your mom and got back home what was the aftermath effects that occurred? Um, I couldn't work. So now I'm trying, I still to this day haven't gotten an MRI on my right knee. So I haven't been able to walk the way I usually do. And, you know, I work with, you know, special ed kids and the job I had, I ended up getting fired from that job because they figured out what happened. My, um, the injuries I had, especially with my shoulder, um, I knew my knee was hurt again because I couldn't bend it. But my shoulder was the, I was able to get an MRI on my shoulder and I went to therapy for about three months on my shoulder and they wanted to do surgery. And I told them no. They told me I tore my labrum, I think it's called. Mm. He told me, you know, it definitely was dislocated and I did tear my labrum. And I went to um, advanced rehabilitation in uh, Georgia, Columbus, Georgia. And I did rehab for about three months on my shoulder. He said, you know, it's up to you if you want to go ahead and see the orthopedic surgeon, which I did. And um, she told me she thinks I can, being an athlete, she thinks I can do without getting surgery. So I did not have the surgery, but I did do rehab for a few months. And um, my daughter was able to get see a therapist for about two weeks, two, three weeks she's seen a therapist for, but the insurance wouldn't cover further. And um, so now it's just this time she, you know, had bad dreams. She would wake up and tell me her dreams she had with the cop. And as a mom, I'm like, what do I say? How do I how do I deal with this situation? So. So your daughter suffered from PTSD. It was what it sounds like. Till this day, I believe so. Till this day. How does she react when she sees officers, when you guys are just out and about, or even when you um, traveled up here? She doesn't show that she's scared. She more so, and I don't want her to have that reaction. She's like, I don't like that, mommy. I fight them. I fight them. And I'm like, what, what do I say? So I'm like, no, baby, not all cops are like that. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not with her all the time. She's seeing more and more videos, and she's like, Mommy, cops are bad, and that's all she keeps saying, and I'm like, but this is something that's going around, and I'm pretty sure she's not the only child. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do I do now? How do I deal with it? Because Mommy need help, too. <laughs> I don't like to say I need help, but I need help, too. So it's just been a a constant, I wouldn't say battle with her, but any cop she sees, she's like, mommy, don't go that way. Don't go that way, mommy. Wow. And that's literally everywhere. If she see lights, uh-oh, mommy, he's coming. 
don't go too fast but then and she makes jokes i think that's how she copes with like if you go too fast he gonna get you but then if you go too slow he gonna get you anyway and it's to me it hurts me because i know what she's doing mm-hmm. but at the same time it's like <laughs> she shouldn't have to be this strong as a seven-year-old She's eight now, but at the time she was seven. She should not have to be that. She shouldn't even have to go through that. And then she asked me a question, Mommy, isn't cops supposed to protect us? And I'm like, you know, they do if you need help. She said, but you needed help and the cop didn't help you. Right. What do I say? I didn't know what to say. Because she's right. <laughs> she's right. And, you know, now recently the video got out. And um, it's a lot of her friends have seen it in the classroom she's in. Her teachers have seen it. And they've reached out to me, Ms. Miller, are you okay? Do you and Nevaeh need anything? And I'm, no, we're fine. They're like, yeah. But Nevaeh talks about it every day now in school. Because it's like it's a reopened wound. Because all the kids talk about it. Exactly. And the footage, that was the actual officer's body cam footage. Or not his body cam, excuse me. The camera on the dash that was his actual footage and they released it a year later how come i don't know i didn't know it was posted until someone reached my dad actually reached out to me and said cat your video is posted on tiktok i didn't have a tiktok and i went and i looked and i'm like who are these i didn't know the person who posted it but i guess he's he's big on tiktok and youtube and a lot of my family seen it then and then I get because I had told my family what happened, but I guess them seeing it was kind of like that actually happened. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you thought I was lying, <laughs> but now it's kind of like you know it's real. It's here. What was some of the feedback? What was some of the feedback that you received from your family, your friends, colleagues once the footage was released? You know, I thought I would. I thought I would have a little more support. Um. Because a lot of them just kind of sent a message. It was like, hey, hope you and the are okay. I knew they were talking in reference to the video, but they didn't say anything. Like, you know, hey, do you need anything? Are you okay? I actually got more help from people who I didn't know at all. Like, at all. I seen a woman in Walmart. She was like, sweetheart, give me a hug. And I'm like... I don't know you. She recognized you from the video. Right. So now I'm, I'm, it's a realization for me, like, Kat, you have to, you're going to have to speak about it because it's out there. Now there's a bunch of different sides and I didn't want people to make their own story of it. I want them to hear what happened for me and why I made the decision I did. Because, you know, everyone can have their views on it, but you don't know what you would do unless you're, you know, you, you, you're in that situation. Absolutely. So now it's kind of like, you know what, it's here. I got to either fight it and deal with it or try to move on. So did you end up turning yourself in? I did. I'm sorry, I missed out. No, no, totally fine. What happened when you turned yourself in? I went in two weeks later. I went and uh, I found a criminal attorney. I ended up, um, I obtained him and one of my friends went with me to the police department. And um, my attorney actually came there with me. I stayed and they took me in, fingerprinted me. I was in jail for about eight to nine hours. They they put you in a cell? Yeah, I had to go change my clothes, take the picture, everything. So now I'm like, what is going on? Why am I here? I, I turned myself in. I'm thinking it was gonna be a quick process. No, I had to be bonded out. But initially the officer stated previously when you were in the ambulance, you said that you weren't under arrest. Right. And he didn't state that you were under arrest when he handcuffed you either. Right. So now they said that the officer, he put in a citation. I didn't receive a citation at the time I was of the, the accident. He put in a citation for speeding. Um, something with my tag, I forgot what it was called. Something, improper tag display obstruction of a police officer and driving with my license suspended. So all four of those I was being charged with that I didn't know, didn't even know about it until I got to the, you know, to the jail. 
And um, so I'm sitting in jail. I guess my business partner is asking, like, how come she's not out yet? What is going on? They're like, oh, she's she's been booked. And I'm like, why am I booked? What is what I'm in jail with a sling on? I have a sling in the jail. So I'm like, okay. What do I do? About eight hours later, they say, you know, you can call a bail bondsman if you know of one. And I'm like, a bail bondsman? For what? (laughs) They're like, well, you got to be, your bond is, I forget how much it was. But how God worked, I end up calling a bail bondsman. He came right down. He said, next time that anything like this happens, you need to call a bail bondsman beforehand just in case. Because that's what they do every time. But to me, I'm like, this is what people go through. They get down there thinking they're turning themselves in or whatever is happening. And now they're in jail. They can't get out. So the bail bondsman, um, I don't remember how much he charged me. But it was little to nothing. It was like maybe a couple hundred dollars, like $200. I had $205 on me. <laughs> he took that and said, God bless you. And let me know if you need me again. He said, next time, take my number. You call me beforehand. And he asked me how long I was sitting there. I said, I sat in here for about eight hours. He said, you should only been there for about 10 minutes. And so now when you Google my name, usually my track pictures come up, everything. It has my jail picture on Google underneath my name. So now it's a depiction of what I'm not. And it's just, um, I was trying to figure out how I can get it off of Google. What What do I do? Because <laughs> now it's like I'm a criminal and I didn't do anything. And I have no problem admitting when I do something wrong. I will tell you quick. I apologize. I was wrong. I had, I really don't believe I did anything wrong. I'm, I think every day, like, maybe I should have stayed in the car. But then I think, what if I stayed in the car? The, uh, the other officers came. I would have been arrested, and they would have took, took my baby. You know, there's so many different possibilities. So I really don't think I did anything wrong. I never once cursed at him. I didn't yell. I didn't kick. I didn't punch at him. I didn't pull away from him. I didn't fight him. The only person who fought him was a seven-year-old for her mom. And it's like, it's something not just I have to live with, but now a young girl who was raised that cops are supposed to protect you. Now she has this image in her head that, no, she's scared of cops and she doesn't like them. And I have family members who are officers I was actually in training, and I don't think I ever said it, but um, I took the PT test in Columbus to be a police officer. He told me, Catherine, we love you. I passed everything. But because you have this on your record, you're going to have to wait two years. And I'm like, well, what is two years going to do from everything was dismissed off my criminal record? He said, well... I can't say, but my boss said you can reapply in two years. So it's like it's it stopped my my life. I have a master's degree, full scholarship from Boston University, bachelor's degree from Boston University, and I can't get a job I'm supposed to have. How long were you out of work since the incident occurred? It's been a year. This whole year. I haven't worked this whole year. How has that affected you in its entirety financially? I had to depend on other people. You know, I I coach on the side. Um, I try to cook for people. I do meal prep. I am a nutritionist. So I cook for people on the side. I coach my young kids. Um, I work with children with autism. So sometimes I do in-home work. But even then, once they found out what happened, they were like, you know, it's kind of a, it doesn't look good on their company. So I end up, lost that job. And it's like, I, what am I supposed to do now? So I've been coaching here and there. I had to turn to bartending. So I'm out all night now. Away from your daughter. Right. I got to find someone to be with my baby. When when I was teaching, I can, I'm home. I'm a homebody. I love being home with my baby. I do activities for her. My house is set up <laughs> like a classroom. 
So during the day, on the weekend, she doesn't have a tablet. My baby does not own a, she doesn't have a phone. We don't do TikTok and well, the other stuff, she, she what's she call it? What's the other Snapchat. Thing? She, she don't do all that. We We go and we have science time. We have history time. We have reading time. We have dressed up on our history days. Sometimes we'll dress up as our characters, her favorite character from a book. We'll go out to Goodwill and try to find the outfits that she likes. She loves that. So now I like to stimulate her mind because that's something I wish I had growing up. I didn't have that. So I'm like, you know what? I know a lot of people say, you know, you grow up or you raise your kids how you were grown up. I don't want that. How were you uh, raised? Um, I can say my dad was, um, I grew up, it was just me and my dad who's in military. So it's a military brat. I've lived in, um, California, Virginia. So I've lived all over and I was maybe at a school six months and had to switch to another school, you know? And, um, so I, I was known as the social butterfly. I could get along with anyone. I don't have any close friends. I don't have anyone I can say that's my best friend or, and um, with my dad, it was, you're going to be the best. And that's what it was. Since I was seven years, I think I was eight, running in San Diego, California. I was the best in San Diego. So you're going to be the best. I didn't miss a day, sick or not. And then when he uh, got his divorce with my stepmom, you know, he gave me the choice. He said, you can stay in California. Or we can move to Connecticut to be closer to my mom. I didn't get, get to grow up with my mom. So I was like, you know what? I want to get, get to know my mom. And I got two other sisters on my mom's side. Let me get to know that side of the family. And to me, I, I guess I kind of put the blame on myself because I said I wanted to go see mommy. We moved to Connecticut. My freshman year, I went to Bloomfield High School. And I raced with, uh, I ran with one of the, she was number one in the country. I was excited to run with her. Stacey Ann Smith. Yeah, I'm talking about you, girl. But yes, she was number one in the country. And um, <laughs> we got there. No one had ever ran close to her. And I was, you know, I'm nowhere near faster than her. But because she was there, she was helping me get faster. So it was kind of back and forth. And I was just wheeling her in. My dad was like, just get closer and closer every day. And then my my mom was at every track meet. And I would break records every time she was there. And then she just left. She left and moved to Georgia. And I'm like, why would you leave? I came here for you. Why would you leave? Never got an answer. Didn't get a set answer on why you left. How did that make you feel? Did you feel like your mom abandoned you in some way? Yeah, it was like all over again. Now the thoughts I had... It kind of validated it. At least that's how I felt. From there, I haven't, to me, I haven't ran the the way I feel like I could. Because I would be at track meets and my dad was like, you know, daddy's here. I was like, I know daddy going to be there. He's going to be there. It was kind of like, why mommy don't want me? That's how I always felt. Because my stepmom, when my dad got divorced from her, all of a sudden, she wasn't in the home. I had my two sisters on my dad's side. I have two sisters on my mom's side. I was always left alone. I didn't have anyone there. So they had someone, and then my sisters on my mom's side, they had each other, and it was just me. But I was like, what do I do? <laughs> How do I move on? So now I went to Weaver my sophomore year. And <laughs> at Weaver was kind of a eye-opener for me. Because back, I was the freshman, I wore the bobos in my head that said, I love Jesus on it. So I was like, I had I had pigtails. So going to Weaver was kind of, that's where it gave me tough skin. I had girls trying to jump me, everything. I done had a gun pulled out on me at Weaver High School in the locker room. Weaver toughened me up. And, you know, it was when I used to try to talk about it a little bit, it was kind of like, oh, you lying or you'll be all right. So I grew up kind of dealing with it. Just deal with it. You know, I cleaned up everything in the house and I had to basically, I took the backlash from my dad's 
divorces, I took the backlash. Nobody else was there. So I was in the house when he would be angry or mad. So I would get cursed out, yelled at. And so I've learned to just be like, it's all right. He's just upset. It's okay. But being, that's why I, at Boston University, I went and I did psychology. Because I feel like, you know, I had to change my mind to be like, cat, it's okay. And it's not okay. <laughs> it's really not. But I laugh about it now. Even now. I don't like to cry. Is the laughter your um, coping mechanism? I would say so. I kind of do it. I do it all the time. If I feel myself tearing up, I'm like, nope, you good. But I'm learning to open up a little bit, you know, especially going through um, what I went through in college, being by myself, getting hurt, and um, a situation happened in college my junior year. I'm running okay. I thought for sure, I'm like, I'm going to make it to the Olympics. At one point, I was number six in the country. I was like, I, I've worked, this is what I've worked for. I woke up and couldn't feel my legs. Couldn't walk. What do I do? Only person I know to go to, I call my dad. Daddy, something ain't right. I couldn't go to my coach. My coach wasn't, they have favoritisms. Of course, every school. I wasn't a favorite. But she knew when she put me on the track, I'm going to get those points. But I wasn't a favorite. So when I expressed that, look, my knees are hurting. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. I didn't get the help. I deserve. I was in a wheelchair for about eight months. Almost didn't graduate my senior year. What was the diagnosis, though? I never got a diagnosis. I went in... When that happened, I went home, back home to uh, Connecticut with my dad. Mm. And at this time, he was um, married to another woman. Love her to death, Miss Trudy. She's awesome. And um, I woke up one morning, my little sister was there. And she knows me. I'm, I don't complain about anything. I woke up and I was crying, said I can't feel my legs. At this point, my little sister's like, all right, she gotta be telling the truth because Kat doesn't complain. Miss Trudy comes in, she rubs my knees, and she prays for me. My dad goes, she all right. She all right. She just, she's just faking now. She's, she got this boy. I had my first boyfriend my senior year of college. First boyfriend ever. I didn't have a boyfriend. Wow. <laughs> first boyfriend. So I had someone I talked to freshman year, and that was, but he lived in New York. I was in Boston, so I didn't really. But for, like, actual relationship, your first boyfriend was senior year in college. How How old is that? I was 22. 22? Okay. I had been like 22. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I feel like I did everything right. I didn't, I didn't. But to daddy, oh no, you wrong. You got a boy. It's, he's the reason I'm messing up. That That's that's what, that's what I got from him. Oh, if you wouldn't have had this boy. And it's like, daddy, he has nothing to do with my schooling. He has nothing to do with me being hurt. I don't know why I'm hurt. Nothing. I didn't fall. I just I couldn't feel my legs. So now I'm like, okay. I'm in Connecticut. No help. I just I hopped back on the bus and I went back to Boston. I said I figure it out myself. So I went and I seen maybe four to five different specialists. I seen a rheumatoid arthritis specialist. I seen um, another specialist a knee specialist and they kind of think it's rheumatoid arthritis I, ho I heard it was osteoarthritis I heard it was inflammatory arthritis so it's a bunch of different things but I never got a sick diagnosis so now to me my running career is over I couldn't run I tried to go back to school I tried to get back on the track I had females beating me who never should have came close to me at this point I'm like yep Kat, you're done. <laughs> you're done. That's it. So when you went back to Boston, is that where you met your daughter's father? Or how did you meet him? When I went to, I was home in Connecticut for um, one of the breaks. And I met him back in Connecticut. Okay. Apparently, me and him went to high school together. And I didn't know him, but he knew me. So. And what's your relationship like with him? Yeah. That's actually, he's the person I went through my domestic violence with. So um, 
when I was pregnant with Nevaeh. That's who I went through. And it was another one of those things. He would say, like, you know, I wouldn't go. I wish that was, I wish he would do that. You know, it was one of those. Mm -hmm. But it happened. And when I told the family, this man did everything he could to get family to stop talking to me. And a lot of them did. Friends who I thought were friends stopped talking to me. So now he's separated me and now I'm by myself in Massachusetts with him. Knees hurting. I'm pregnant. What do I do? But to me, I'm like, you know what? I finish. I ended up still finishing. I went back and got my master's. I got my master's in one year. They told me it was a three-year program. I finished in a year. While going through domestic violence and being pregnant with your daughter, you still were able to get your master's. So she, my daughter was born in January of 2015. I got my degree in May of 2015. So she was four months. So I was able to hold her while having my degree. And what did that feel like, being able to hold your baby while you're graduating? I hate to say it, but I couldn't really, I couldn't really enjoy it. Because, yes, I was smiling, and I got this person standing next to me. And my mom was there. She actually flew. She surprised me. She came up from Georgia. But it was like, I shouldn't be. I should be on my way to the Olympics after getting my, my degree. So you weren't even able to enjoy the moment with your daughter. Right. So it's like, I'm happy she's here. But it's like, at the end of this, I still have to go home to this person. And I was trying to figure out how to get out. And to me, I'm going to toot my own horn. I'm one of the strongest women I know. But I still I still went through it. This person, like, what do you do if they take your phone, smash it? He would break my laptop. I'm stuck in the house with this person. He would turn off the electricity, so now I'm in the pitch black. And I'm, like, blocking me from leaving the apartment. What do you do? All while your daughter was in the house. Yeah, I'm holding her four months. And he didn't even think to himself, like, my daughter's here, let me stop. Not one time. So how did you get out for you and your daughter? Um, the Well, when I was eight months pregnant, I, w I was put in the hospital with her. And I can I call myself and I say, you know what, Kat, you're dumb. You could have got out. And I went back to him. And I know it happens a lot. And it's like, well, Kat, you're dumb. Why would you go back to him? I had to figure it out on my own. And when I went back, that's when um, the last straw for me was he had never actually physically put his hands on me. It was always just, I'm going to take your stuff. I'm going to lock you in. You do what I say. Stop me from going places. Mental and emotional abuse. Right. But that that one time he decided... Nevaeh was in the bed. He picked me up over his head, and he slid me on the, on the ground, and I blacked out. I didn't even know my head was bleeding in the back. My main thought was I got to run and go get Nevaeh. I was on the ground, and I jumped up. He put a taser out on me, and he tased me twice. Didn't feel it. Couldn't tell you what it felt like to be tased. Don't know. I took it out of his hand and took the battery out. Didn't know I was hurt. Didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Until the guy from the, the cops came and the ambulance came. He said, sweetheart, your head is bleeding. I was like, I'm okay. He said, no, you're not. You need to go to the hospital. I said, I'm all right. I had Nevaeh with me. That's all I, that's all that matter. I was went in a, when I went to the hospital, I don't remember exactly when it happened. Well, I know I was in a coma for two weeks. And the only thing I could think, it was like I heard a voice in my head, cat, get up. And when I jumped up, DCF was there. It was a bunch of stories they thought I had. They said, He told them I was on drugs. I popped pills. That's why I fell out. And So he said things to get DCF to take the baby from you. Right. Which, thank, thankfully, they did not because they wanted to speak to me first. And um, that's how he filed for full custody of her. And um, I'm grateful he did. I'm glad he did because my DCF worker, <laughs> Miss Blossom, still to this day, my daughter's father's Jamaican. And um, 
she happened to be Jamaican. And she sat with me and she talked to me and she said, there's nothing wrong with you. She said, I see right, I see right through him. She said, we're going to make sure you get the help you need. And if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have my baby. Probably wouldn't have her. But Lord knows, and I hate to say it, I always said, I don't see how a mom could not fight for her baby. And I just felt like my mom didn't fight for me. So I said, no matter what, even if I do lose my baby, I'm going to get my baby back. Because I know I ain't doing nothing wrong. And I'm going to keep coming. <laughs> I'm going to keep coming. They're going to be like, you know what? Ain't nothing wrong with her. And so I said, well, if they do take her, I'm going to just I'm gonna become a millionaire. And I'm going to just go pay for her. <laughs> like <laughs> I said, I'm going to figure something out. But again, they're going to be laughing again. I still went through it with him. My daughter's dead, even to this day. I gotta, but now I got to the point where I can block the messages out. So he still is in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and you're in Georgia. Mm -hmm. I had to get permission to move to Georgia. I was gonna ask you that because I know there is some type of stipulation when mothers want to relocate. You do have to seek permission from the father, but there's like a a court, a court hearing, a court order. Okay. And uh, he, um, we had a parenting schedule, and um. He had permission to call her and speak to Nevaeh, which I have no problem with that. I'm not a mom to be like, no, you hurt me, so you can't speak to your daughter. I want you to speak to your daughter. I want her to get to know you for you, herself. And she's done that. He went, to, he drove down with another female to pick her up. Two years ago, he picked up Nevaeh and, uh, at the police station. Nevaeh screamed and cried. She screamed and cried. She didn't want to go. I said, Nevaeh, mommy, mommy will get you back. Three days later, I get a phone call from Nevaeh. Mommy, the cops got daddy. I lost that job I had. I left on the spot. I drove all the way up here to Connecticut. Took me like 14 hours to get here. Got here so fast. He got arrested for fighting with the other female he was with. So she, what I tried to prevent her from seeing with me and him, She's seen with him regardless with another female. So, you know, the cops was asking, you know, who's the mom? And there was another female that was there was saying, oh, I'm, she's with me. And I said, no, I'm mommy. <laughs> and so Nevaeh is now at her aunt's house, which is his sister. The mom has called me and said, Kat, you need, you know, she's crying now. She's like, come, come get Nevaeh. And before he had his family believing that I was hitting him. So they didn't like me for a while. It was, it was a lot of back and forth, but I just kind of left it alone until they started to see, like, you know what? It's not Kat. Like, no, I've never hit that man. So is that why you instilled the way you raised your daughter so, right. you know what I mean? Like, so like thick and cemented in because you went through so much. Mm -hmm. So how is her relationship with her father now? Like present moment today? Um I actually in June he had he had a son in April and I drove up here so Nevaeh could meet him. And I let her stay with him overnight. And she she said she had fun, she had a blast. Neve he bought Nevaeh a phone and Nevaeh told him, No, mommy doesn't want me to have a phone because I'm not ready yet. He bought it anyway. And uh, when I got to the house, I was picking her up. He said, I bought Nevaeh a phone and she's going to use it to call me. And that's that's what's going to happen. And immediately it was like a flashback because that's how he used to talk to me. And I used to just be like, okay. You know, I just used to kind of get small. Like, okay. Because that's how my dad used to talk to me. And I've been raised to, you know, you got to be obedient. So I used to just go, okay. So this time I'm looking and I'm like, my baby's here. Is this what I want her to see? So I told him, I said, Jay, I have no problem with Nevaeh having a phone, but she would not have a phone right now. He said, well, I bought it and she's going to take it. Let's go. And he put it in the bag and Nevaeh walked out. <laughs> and um, along he has stairs. He almost knocked me down the stairs and Nevaeh seen it. And I'm trying to record. So now we get in the car. And Nevaeh is crying. She said, Mommy, I don't want to go back there. 
I took the phone out the bag. I get out the car. And at this point, I'm like, okay, he's either going to hit me. He's going to try to knock me down. I didn't care. I'm like, yeah, it's not happening to me no more. You're not doing this. I put the phone on the grass. I said, have a good night. He, you know, was yelling and cursing at me. Now his other girlfriend is looking at me. We are 32. And I seen in her face how I used to look. And I say to her, I said, sweetheart, your son comes first. I don't know this little girl. She's 21 years old. He's 11 years older than her. I said, sweetheart, your baby comes first. I went through it. And now I know how to keep my man. That's it. And I got in the car in the bay. I said, mommy, you're the strongest woman I know. And right then and there, I was like, you did right. You did good. So I tried to think, you know, I let her have her de- depiction of her father. You think that's important for mothers to allow the kids to make their own depiction of the parent? To a certain extent. Yeah. How, how come? Because I've seen with being a psychology major and working with kids, I work with teenagers in high school. When they get older, they're going to question, Mommy, what happened to Daddy? How come Daddy's not here? How come you don't let me talk to Daddy? They're going to question at some point. So I'd rather her, I don't want her to get hurt, but I also want her to see why mommy does what she does, why it is the way it is. And she's eight now, and this was when she was seven. She can speak for herself. And whenever he calls, I say, Nevaeh, daddy's calling. You want to speak to daddy? Sometimes she'll say yes, sometimes she'll say no. And I don't force her. And I think that's where the court system also messes up. You force the kids to do things they don't want to. They should have a choice. And I give her that choice. But she knows if anything happens, you can go see daddy if I want her to know. If something happens, you call mommy. And a lot of moms, I realize, they get mad at the child because they're, they want to go to daddy. So they get mad at the child. So now I'm wanting Nevada to know that the good, the bad, the ugly, whether mommy's mad at you or not, you call mommy, mommy gonna be there. And I think now she knows that. At least I hope so. So she says it now. We're here, We I let her see her grandma, she's seen her aunties, her other cousins on his side, she's with them now. And this is her first time actually staying with them while I'm not there. So. I want her to be able to make that decision. I want her to know her other side. I didn't get to know my whole family. I'm getting to know them now as an adult. But I didn't get to be around my cousins, and I have so many. I want her to be able to be around them and make her own decision. But know right from wrong. Know if something happens, you don't have to guess and figure out who to call. And that's what I had to figure out. Like, okay, I don't have anyone there. Who do I call? She knows, I'm calling mommy, she'll tell you. She'll tell me, I'm calling mommy. So that's important to me. And that's something I would tell all moms. I know it's hard. It It is hard let, letting your child go, especially seeing her cry and scream. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> you know, what do I do? But she knows now, and now she sees that okay now I see why mommy did that well you know they say mother is God in the eyes of a child so I believe that your daughter sees that in you yes ma'am you're doing you're doing amazing you're doing good I did want to get into more questions about her if you're open to it yes that's fine what is she like as a student in school um Neve is like I was she's a social butterfly she can get along with anyone, that girl. and But to teachers, that's a problem. They're like, oh, she's talking too much. She's walking around. But me being a teacher, sometimes you got to accommodate the student. She just, she doesn't disrupt, but she likes to get up and walk around. She can't sit still. I don't know if you notice, even me, I, my hands, I'm always wanting to move. That's just, that's how I am. But she's, it's hard to keep her attention. 
you know, um, and as a mom, I was getting frustrated because even doing her reading and math, I'm like, you know this stuff. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm like, Kat, you got to calm down. Because with other kids, I'm real calm. But, you know, this is mine. I'm like, you know this stuff. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. But I'm like, you know, as a mom, how do you attack this situation? What do you do? Mm-hmm. So now I'm like, okay. She likes to read. She that, that woman could draw you, that little girl, sorry. She can draw you freehand just from looking at you. Wow. That's something she loves to do. She loves to draw. So I'm like, okay. I found her little hobby. You know, everyone's like, oh, she got to be in the sports. She doesn't really like sports. Oh, because you were an athlete, so they automatically assumed. Okay. Right. I tell Nevaeh, and I think that's important as well. You can do it if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And that kind of opened her. She loves flag football, but she's she's so goofy. But she's tall. She's very tall. She's like up to my nose. Wow. Yeah, it's eight. She's eight. Wow. And how tall are you? I'm like five six, five seven. Wow. So she's she's huge. Okay. And so when she's playing, she's like, "Mommy, look, I'm gonna block that shot." She like blocks the the little boy's shots, and she's like, <laughs> "She's laughing." But she's highly intelligent. She pays attention to everything. That's why I didn't want her to come today. <laughs> Yeah. She pays attention to everything and she asks questions. So when you think she's not watching, she'll play and act like she's not listening. And then later on, she'll be like, Mommy, how come you said this? And I'm like, Why are you in girl folks' conversation? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> she's, um, <laughs> that's my pride and joy. She's what I wish I could have been. And I can say that. Before, you know, a lot of moms get jealous of the of the of the child. You think so? I do. And me that's just me teaching. I see it a lot. They get jealous of their kids, especially the high school girls. It's the mom and daughter feud all the time. Mm. But if you take the time to actually get to talk to your child, get to know them, and not be a friend, but some someone your child can talk to. Do you believe that parents can be their child's friend? To a certain extent. It has to has to be a boundary. Like Nevaeh says all the time, that's my best friend. And that's that's fine with me. But she also knows mommy doesn't curse. You know, she there's certain standards I, I live by. And um a lot of people tell me I'm too strict on her. Let her be a kid, let her get a TikTok, let her spend the night over her friend's house. Why are you against social media? I wouldn't say I'm against it, but um even with these games now, they don't put on parental controls. She had a Roblox account. And on Roblox, there was a man, they can speak and they can speak to anyone, anyone can join in. And there was a man she was talking to on there. And I heard the voice. You can hear their voices and everything. And I'm like, who is this man? Who are you talking to? What is what is happening? So I jumped on. It's a bunch of different comments. They're cursing, saying F this, F that. It's like GTA. But Roblox supposed to be a kid game. So I get on and I tell the man, he said, oh, let's meet up. Cool, let's go. Where you want to meet at? But I think he caught on. I wasn't talking. You told the man, where can we meet at? Right. <laughs> Probably was crazy. Probably shouldn't have did it. But as a mom, it's like we have to watch these things. And so... For a while, I was listening to family members like, let her have it. She's fine. You being too strict. I'm not changing me. And I realize teachers, they realize it. Like, Neve is different from the other kids. She knows how to play outside and play hopscotch. She knows how to jump rope. She can color and draw and have fun. She's stimulating her mind. Me and her write poems together. We read books together. We'll write our own story. She'll tell me her story. I'll tell her mine. And we put it together and be like, see it match. We do stuff like that. But I watch my students in school and I'm like, they're bored. The teachers aren't creative like they used to be. And I'm not talking bad about them. But when we had our old school teachers, you know, the, the older ladies and men, they did things with us. They taught us. Nowadays, it's a Chromebook. Here you go. Go on Lexi, I Excel. You got to make it to this level, but it's not teaching them. They're just getting through the levels just to get through it. But are they remembering it? 
And that's why a lot of my students, we we don't even, um we do the work. Mm. But a lot of times I just talk to them to see where their mind is. And then you get to find out they're going through, we want them to focus on this curriculum and the school system when they, half of them didn't eat last night. Some of my students didn't eat. So I'm like, okay, they stink. They smell like, you know, they haven't showered. So we got kids worried about real life situations, yes, but they're living like they're in jail. So it's like as a teacher, how are you supposed to just block that out? And I don't. You can't. So what I do, I created a school store in my classroom. I give them fake Monopoly money. I buy my own food and I put snacks in there, juice, you know, ginger ale. It's good snacks, you know, chewy bars and stuff. We create protein shakes in the classroom, but they got to pay for it. So I teach them how to budget their money. With the Monopoly money. Right. So they have to budget it. And they're like, oh, well, I only got $15. I don't know what to tell you. Did you pay your rent? So I make them, okay, we have a fake house. They got their car. Oh, you want a Mercedes, but you only make this much. So we do credit classes like that. So you're teaching them responsibility. Right, at the same time, but they're still getting their food. They still, they buy bars of soap from me. All right, go in the bathroom. You can only buy one bar. You only got this much. So they go in the bathroom. I give them a chance to go wash up in the bathroom. They go, we have a bathroom in my classroom. You want to buy some pants? I want those pants. Those are $20. You only got 10 you know. So you used your own money to supply the needs of your students. I think it, yeah. And I don't have much, but I give them what I didn't have, you know. And I think that's important. I didn't have, I used to always wear my cousin's hand-me-downs until it got to the point. I couldn't fit her clothes no more because I got a little bit bigger than her. My feet are bigger. I got, I'm got size 10. She's a 7. What do we do? You know, I didn't get to have that. You know, my dad tried. My dad was, cat, you don't need no clothes. I had track clothes. I didn't have, you know, nice clothes. I didn't get to get a coach bag and Gucci belt, you know, all that stuff. So to me, those little things mean the world. And I know my students appreciate it. They tell me all the time. That's why I wish I can have my own classroom. But I'm working on getting my license now. And uh, this cop situation is kind of holding me back from that. But I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to get it. Because I know. And I keep thinking maybe I'm meant for more. Maybe I should, shouldn't should be in the classroom. Maybe I should be out helping other kids and just people in general. Because people come to me now. I own a gym in Georgia. You own a gym, a gym in Georgia? Mm-hmm. I own a small gym called Expressions Oasis. And actually one of my autistic kids came up with the name. He said it by accident. I said, what'd you say? He said, Expressions. He said, we got to Expressions ourselves. And I was like, I like it. And that's been my name. That's my logo. If you look at my logo, I have it tattooed on me. But it's a, sorry, it's a flower. And I did it It's holding the globe with your hands but in the middle of it is whatever logo you want it to be if you like music it could be your music if you like to sing it could be a microphone to me I put a a track runner that's my that's in the middle and the only way that can this flower can blossom is if we work together to bloom it so that's where that came from I think that's really beautiful So I call it a gym, but it's really more than a gym. I have some people who come in just to sit down in my yoga studio. Place of peace. Mm -hmm. They just sit. And they pay me to come sit. And I'm like, (laughs) you don't want a a class? You want a massage today? Are you hungry? Nope. Okay. Close the door. Lock it. Go sit down. Turn the lights on. (laughs) With everything that you've endured and went through and shared with me today, how do you find peace because you seem like such a peaceful individual sitting in front of me right now where do you pull that from and how do you instill that in your daughter um my peace you know I've been hearing that a lot lately you know the people who I've encountered said cat you know you're always doing for everyone else when are you gonna do for you doing for me is me doing for others it makes me feel good when I do for others So when I see 
that I've helped someone even it, it doesn't have to be publicized or anything if I see you're happy I'm happy and that's just how I am and my daughter's the same way so that's why what I do I see my baby and she helps no matter what we could be in a grocery store and I'm like Nevaeh let's go no mommy she's having a hard time she can't reach it and I can't be mad because that's something I would do and that's something I would tell other moms you know let your child be who they are but instill the right well who's to say what's right instill the And still the right, um, don't listen to other criticisms from everyone else. Do what you feel is right for you and your ch- your children. And I have one. And I believe she's she's awesome. She's going to change the world, that little girl. And I see it. I see you want to be president? No, mommy. I'm going to own a farm and I'm going to feed all the people. And I'm not going to kill the animals. I said, like, how you going to have a farm and you don't kill the animals? What they going to eat? We all going to eat together. We going to eat bread. She said, Jesus gave people bread. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> said he gave them fish, too. Said, well, sometimes the fish die. So if the fish die, I'll just cook them. Oh, my goodness. She's a scenario thinker. I love that. Very much so. Tell me five things that you feel make a great parent. Hmm, It's hard. Five things I could say make a great parent is communication. And that's in any relationship, really. Communication. You know, being trustworthy. You want your kids to know they can trust you. Um, listening. Um, activities. And a safe haven. Providing a safe haven for them. I realize it's really important. They know you're going to give them food for the most part. You're going to have food. You're going to have clothing. They're going to, you know, be clean. But listen to them. It'll take you a long way. I promise. <laughs> it will. Well said, Kat. I think you are a wonderful woman. I think you're resilient. I think you're phenomenal. I think you're strong. I think you're downright amazing. Thank you. I appreciate you. Absolutely. And your daughter would be proud of you. We here at Parental Vision want to make sure that your story is heard by as many people as possible. And like I told you before, I don't know what's going to come of it but your story does deserve to be heard. So thank you again for coming to share it with me. It was hard. <laughs> but but you did it and we got through it, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Absolutely. That's a wrap for Parental Vision. Once again, I'm Tiana. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>